taking the time to listen to me once more. Um, let's see how it goes. So, so this is about sort of a class of partial differential equations that uh, I found interesting in recent times. And so, uh, well, I will start with a little survey of the kinds of problems one might want to treat. All these equations turn out to be Hamiltonian, and uh, that's why the Ham word Hamiltonian appears in the title. So let's look at some examples. Euler equations would be an example. I don't understand much about the Euler equations. It's too difficult for me. Vlasov equation is Hamiltonian. The quantization of the Vlasov equation is turns out to be Newtonian mechanics of point particles. That's also tends to be Hamiltonian. Combinations of Vlasov with Maxwell, that's something that appears in astrophysics quite a lot. Then the nonlinear Schrödinger equation or the Hartree equation. Uh, they appear in the so-called mean field limit of quantum theory and are uh, therefore quite interesting and important. Uh, we should distinguish between non-focusing and focusing equations. That corresponds to repulsive versus attractive pair interactions of the quantum particles whose mean field limit is described by these equations. If these forces are attractive, in other words, if the equation is focusing, then there are soliton solutions, and one can uh, worry about the soliton dynamic. This is quite an interesting topic. These solitons are something like extended particles and satisfy equations of motion that are you know, close to the Newtonian equations of motion of point particles, but with a little built-in friction. Uh, one of the interesting open questions here is a uh, in the question of integrability. Suppose you look at the uh, Hartree equation, say, with a focusing nonlinearity in a confining external potential. It has solitary wave solutions. It could be that the motion of these solitary waves is a uh, you know integrable but this is a an open question and uh, it's probably a little beyond something I could do but if uh, Burgan were here he probably could do it I imagine then uh, if you uh, don't like bosons you see the sh nonlinear Schrödinger and Hartree really comes from the quantum theory of Bose gases, if you prefer Fermi gases, you end up with the hartree fock and the Bogolyubov hartree fock equation. They are interesting, for example, in astrophysics. You can describe the onset of collapse of a star using the hartree fock equation. It would be very interesting to understand more about the collapse profile. They also appear in atomic and molecular physics. Then there are other nice equations such as the, as the Maxwell axion equations that are important in the study of cosmological magnetic fields, etc. I, of course, I cannot cover all these equations, and you know some of them I don't really understand much about. So I have to make a choice, and my choice is to consider coupled particle wave dynamics. The wave medium corresponds to a Bose gas or to the electromagnetic field. And I will be interested in the effective dynamics of particles coupled to this wave medium. In particular, I want to analyze the phenomenon of Cherenkov radiation and of Hamiltonian friction. So that's really, that's why it is in blue. That's the topic of today's talk. Of course, if you have questions concerning some of the other equations, you just go ahead and ask them. All right, so, so here is a quote from Aristotle. A moving body will come to rest as soon as the force pushing it no longer acts on it in the manner necessary for its propulsion. That's, of course, motion with friction. And Aristotle thought that every type of motion is a motion with friction. 
it was not a good starting point to develop mechanics, but everyday intuition says that it's not entirely wrong to believe uh, that this might be the case. So the problem we want to discuss today is to understand how Aristotle's mechanics can be derived from Newton's inappropriate regimes. That's really the topic. So the results I'm going to present uh, have thrown out of joint work. Uh, the, the ones I'm focusing on today, mostly with Gang Zhou, a Chinese mathematician, who is very good, and uh, some of it also with Avi Sopo. So here's a little table of contents. Uh, I will start with a little introduction to the types of equations and how they come up. I will then focus on a simple model. Uh, then I want to uh, describe diffusion and friction as the, these types of motion appear from Hamiltonian dynamics. Then I will present the theorem and sketch a few vague ideas about how to prove it. And uh, I will then uh, discuss some conclusions. So here is the introduction. So the topic of today's lecture is how to pass from fundamental dynamics to effective dynamics. Most of the dynamics we see in real life is effective dynamics, diffuses for motion with friction, uh, certainly not, uh, you know, the, the equations we use, such as the diffusion equation or the Boltzmann equation, are effective dynamical equations. They are not considered to be fundamental. Fundamental dynamical equations are Hamiltonian equations of motion, such as those that appear in celestial mechanics, or if you prefer quantum mechanics, the Schrödinger equation that determines the unitary evolution, time evolution. And we want to understand how to pass from these fundamental dynamical equations to effective equations, such as diffusion equations, equations of motion with friction, or quantum mechanically, say, a lint flood dynamic. I will illustrate how to pass from fund fundamental to effective dynamics on the example of the dynamics of pa point particles coupled to dispersive media. Uh, and among these media could be the electromagnetic field, but in fact today I will consider a Bose gas exhibiting Bose-Einstein condensation, and I will mostly discuss uh, the emission of Cherenkov radiation and, and the resulting particle motion with friction. So here is a simple model. I consider the system consisting of a particle or several particles interacting with, say, a quantum Bose gas in the mean field limit. The mean field limit is a limit where the interaction between the particle and the Bose gas and also among the atoms in the Bose gas are very weak, but the density is very high. In this limit, limiting regime, uh, the dynamics become classical, classical Hamiltonian dynamics. So let's look at the Hamilton functions or functionals of the various components of the system. The Hamiltonian of the particle is given by kinetic energy, p squared over twice the mass of the particle plus the potential. I will consider, for example, the potential describing a constant external force. As, a, as an example, the Hamilton functional of a Bose gas in the mean field limit is, formula, is found as follows. You introduce the Ginzburg-Landau order parameter of the gas. That is a complex valued wave field, psi of x. Uh, we will then require that psi of x is in some Sobolev space. Physical interpretation is as follows. If you take the absolute value of psi of x squared, it corresponds to the density of the gas at the point x. All right. 
rho, by rho I denote the mean density of the gas. And here is now the Hamilton functional of the system. It's an integral over all of space, one over twice the mass of a, of a atom in the Bose gas, gradient of psi of x squared, that describes the kinetic energy, plus a potential energy describing two body interactions, uh, lambda over two and then integral d by mm, phi is a two body potential. For reasons of thermodynamic stability, we want to assume that this two body potential is of positive type and that the coupling uh, constant is greater or equal to zero. If that were not the case, the system would not behave thermodynamically. The phase space on which this Hamilton functional is defined can be chosen to be the W space H1 of R3. It can be equipped with the Poisson brackets given by uh, uh, the following formulas. Two psi is Poisson com commute, two psi bar is Poisson commute, and the Poisson bracket between psi of x and psi bar of y is i times the Dirac delta function. If you don't like the mean field limit but would like to do the full quantum mechanics, you replace Poisson brackets by minus i kappa times a commutator. Kappa is the deformation parameter related to the inverse density here in this case. And that's simply the, you know, the recipe of Heisenberg and Dirac for how to quantize such systems. This particular system describing a Bose gas in the mean field limit has a continuous symmetry this uh, it's a U1 symmetry, it consists of phase transformation of the Ginzburg Landau order parameter, global phase transformation. This symmetry is broken in any state of the system that has a positive mean density. Let's, for example, consider uh, the following boundary conditions at infinity. Psi of x is supposed to approach sphere root of rho when x tends to infinity. This is a boundary condition that, of course, breaks the phase symmetry, obviously. Now, uh, the breaking of such a continuous symmetry is usually accompanied by uh, Goldstone modes, gapless modes, and uh, these modes uh, correspond to the sound waves in the in the Bose gas, in the Bose Einstein condensate. Now, uh, this uh, interacting Bose gas is still a little hard to analyze, so let's simplify a little bit. We consider the Bogolyubov limit of the Bose gas, and that's the following limit. You let the coupling constant, oh, uh, no. you let the coupling constant of the two body interactions tend to zero and the density you let tend to infinity and you keep the product lambda times rho fixed. Then the Hamiltonian of the Bose gas simplifies as follows. Remember beta of x is the fluctuation around uh, this around the sphere of rho. Then in terms of beta and its complex conjugate beta bar, the Hamilton functional in the Bogolyubov limit becomes quadratic. And it's written here. Phi is the real part of beta and pi uh, the imaginary part of beta. So in terms of pi and phi, the Hamilton functional uh, looks like this. And uh, the, you know, phi and pi are standard canonically conjugate variables of this infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. Now it's easy to derive the Hamiltonian equations of motion from this Hamilton functional. Here they are, phi double dot. The dot means derivative with, a, with respect to time. Phi double dot is equal to minus one over two m Laplacian pi dot. And then you plug in the equation of motion for pi and find that phi satisfies this type of wave equation. This 
wave equation has constant precision, so you can easily solve it by Fourier transformation, and you find that a uh, plane wave with wave vector k has a frequency capital omega of k given by this formula. I mean that's a, a very simple exercise with Fourier transformation. Let's look at how this uh, frequency omega of k behaves when k, when the wave vector k tends to zero, where it rises linearly in the modulus of k with a coefficient that has the interpretation of being the speed, the propagation speed of the sound waves. This is a little interesting, and maybe you should try to remember this. You see, if you turned off the interaction completely, you would end up with an ideal non-relativistic Bose gas for which the frequency of a mode with wave vector k is quadratic in k, so it's like a k string. As soon as you turn on interaction, the leading behavior at small wave vectors is linear. Uh, that's something to be kept in mind. Now, what are the interactions between the particle and the atoms in the Bose gas? Again, I assume there are two body interactions given by a potential W, and the interaction Hamiltonian you know, tells us that the, the potential energy between the tracer particle at position capital X and an atom in the Bose gas at position little x is given by this W of capital X minus little x. Psi of x squared, remember, is the density of atoms in the Bose gas at the position little x. I subtract for free this constant rho. That should shift the energy of a Hamilton functional by a constant, which is unimportant. Again, I plug in that psi goes like square root of rho plus a fluctuation beta to express this Hamilton functional in terms of beta, and here it is. And then in the limit where rho becomes large, as in the Bobelubov limit, but g becomes small, uh, the quadratic term drops out. All right. And so the total function, Hamilton, Hamilton functional of the coupled system consisting of this tracer particle and the wave medium, the Bose gas, is H particle plus H Bose gas plus this H interaction. And the purpose of the exercise is to analyze the equations of motion for the system and understand the, some qualitative properties of the solution. So the main phenomena I would like to briefly describe is friction and if time permits a few comments about diffusive motion in such systems. I have prepared here a little excursion into the quantum theory of these systems, but perhaps we will skip this because mathematicians tend to be scared of quantum mechanics, and so I might lose the audience if I say too much about it. I, maybe I briefly say a few words about it. You see, the dispersion law of the tracer particle, which is a non-relativistic particle, is energy of moment at momentum capital T is P squared over 2N. So that's this parabola. I plot here energy as a function of momentum. If you add to this dispersion law of the tracer particle, the energy momentum spectrum of the modes of the Bose gas, you get this shady blue region. You see that the joint energy momentum spectrum trace of particle plus Gaussian modes of the Bose gas before the interaction Hamiltonian is turned on uh, is given by this wonderful uh, shaded region. And you see that the dispersion law of the trace of particle above a certain critical momentum, which is mass of the trace of particle times the speed of sound, it is embedded in the continuum. If you now in turn on an interaction between this particle and the modes in the Bose gas, well, these one particle states get dissolved. They become resonances. They disappear in the continuum. 
this is something which mathematics, I mean, of course, people knows everything, but I'm not sure whether. Yeah, in fact, this is a hard one. You know, we've showed that this happens for this system. It's a very disappointingly simple result, and we took an effort of about 70 pages of calculation. Anyway, so that the fact that these one particle states disappear is, uh, you know, due to the fact that a particle that travels faster than the speed of sound emits sound waves and therefore gets decelerated on until its velocity is at the speed of sound of the medium. This is well known from electromagnetism. If you open a book like Jackson on classical electromagnetism and read the chapter on the electrodynamics in an optically dense medium, you will find a little section about Cherenkov radiation, which says that if a charged particle enters an optically dense medium at a speed larger than the speed of light in the medium, it emits Cherenkov radiation. That's the type of radiation that nuclear physicists know from reactor physics. It's this blue light that comes out of the water of the reactor. All right, and so that's the sort of quantum, that's the, the, the simple explanation of where this comes from if you think quantum mechanically. Later on I will say something about motion when the Bose gas is heated to a positive temperature and how diffusion appears, but let's save this for the end. So for now I want to focus on the classical Hamiltonian dynamics particle coupled to the wave medium. Here are the equations of motion at zero temperature. The mass of the particle times its velocity is its momentum. The time derivative of the momentum is given by minus gradient of the external potential acting on the particle minus gradient of the potential exerted or generated by the atoms in the Bose gas. And the equation of motion for the Ginzburg-Landau order parameter of the Bose gas is I beta dot T equals minus Laplace in over two M beta plus two kappa phi convolved with the real part of beta plus mu times W, this two-body potential that uh, describes the interactions between the particle and the atoms in the Bose gas. Uh, shifted to position x sub t. x sub t is the position of the tracer particle at time t. All right, these are the equations of motion. I show them once more. Here the equations of motion for the particle, and here the ones for the wave field or the ginzburg landau order parameter. Now, uh, somebody who is not trained as a mathematician, but rather as a physicist, will start by working out some special solutions of these equations of motion to get the feeling for what to expect. So the easiest type of solution are traveling waves when the external force F vanishes. So I assume that the particle speeds away at a constant velocity V. Therefore, its position goes like V times T plus the initial position. And I make the ansatz that the Ginzburg-Landau order parameter is given by a function gamma sub v evaluated x at x minus capital X of t. I plug this ansatz in the into the equations of motion and find for gamma v uh, a certain you know elliptic equation uh, that has constant coefficients and therefore can again be uh, solved by transformation. This equation, I mean, it's not hard to see that this equation has regular real solution if the speed V is smaller than the speed of sound of the medium, just by Fourier transformation. It turns out these traveling wave solutions or inertial motion solutions are actually asymptotically stable 
following sense, if you pa prepare an initial condition, uh, beta at time zero is small in a suitable sense and the speed of the particle is considerably below the speed of sound, and then you wait long enough, the particle and the wave field will approach, uh, the, the solution will approach this uh, traveling wave solution as time tends to infinity. This is not a particularly easy thing to prove. I mean, it's maybe a nice exercise if you like to, you know, if you have a sleepless night, you can try to prove this. It, it turned out to be much harder than I would have hoped. But anyway, this has been done, so this is understood. All right. Oh, that, uh, of course, that can happen. You see, beta, uh, we, we start with initial conditions that are small. And we follow uh, the solution near the particle. And there, since the particle travels at the speed smaller than the speed of sound, we eventually don't see these waves anymore. They disperse away. So when you wait long enough, you don't see them anymore. <laughs> That's yeah, right. Exactly. Pardon? Comes from this new W. You see this? Yeah, this depends in a nonlinear way on X, on capital X, on the position of the particle. So it really is nonlinear. All right. So. Suppose we would like to construct a solution at the speed larger than the speed of sound in the Bose-Einstein condensate. Well, we can still make this ansatz and try to solve the equation for gamma by Fourier transformation. Turns out to be singular. If I plug this solution back into the equation of motion for the particle, I find that p dot, the acceleration of the particle, different from zero. In fact, it turns out that velocity times acceleration is negative, and therefore this is type friction. All right? So that's sort of the first glimpse we get at this phenomenon of motion of friction. Well, maybe we should now, if there is friction, let's push the particle and see whether I can introduce an external force F in such a way that the system approaches a stationary solution. That's forced traveling waves. The external force is different from zero. Well, here are the equations of motion. I would like, at least asymptotically for a large time, the acceleration of the particle to vanish. That means that F plus this parameter mu that depends on the coupling between the particle and the Bose gas times the real part of integral dx w grad gamma v, this sum should vanish. And gamma v is as above, solves this equation. All right. So here is a little theorem. This is, uh, should not be called a theorem. It's a sort of an observation. If w is smooth, this two-body potential that describes the interaction between the particle and the wave medium, if this is smooth, then there is, exists a constant F max that is finite, such that for external forces that in modulus are bounded above by F max, there are two forced traveling wave solutions. They propagate with, with a speed Vf minus as a stable solution and with a larger speed Vf plus, and that's an unstable solution. F, if the modulus of the external force is larger than F maximal, there are no force traveling wave solutions. So that's maybe a little interesting. I have no particularly good feeling about the stability of these force traveling wave solutions, but my expectation is that the one with the smaller velocity will be stable, the other one is unstable. The un instability is sort of very obvious to see if I have time I can explain it at the end. Oh, you see, I should 
uh, probably make a little picture. I unstable means that if I change the initial conditions a little bit, the solution just runs away. Stable means if I modify the initial conditions a little bit, then asymptotically I will approach a solution of this kind. Oh, well, I mean, uh, you can, uh, the first order computation gives you an impression of what to expect, and, but then afterwards you would have to do the nonlinear analysis. So it is a sort of pretty easy to see what's going on. So this is my force, this is the external force, and then here is the speed of the particle, here is the speed of sound. Turns out then the velocity, the speed of the particle is a little above the speed of sound, we have friction, so we get a profile for the friction force that looks like this. For very large speed, the friction disappears. This is very well known if you have a very rapid particle, it essentially doesn't interact with anybody anymore. I mean, it's also among human beings. The guys who are very rapid don't interact anymore. They have never time to, you know, sit down and talk. So, if I now prescribe the external force, there are two solutions for the, you know, where the friction balances the external force. This is the one that I guess is stable, and this is the unstable solution. And why is it unstable? Well, if you modify your force a little bit, you know, make it a little smaller, then in fact the particle becomes faster. And so you expect to get some runaway. And if the, for the external force is larger than its maximum, the particle will accelerate forever and become arbitrarily fast. That's sort of the heuristic idea. Uh, this is not understood in detail, wha what happens, but that's, I guess, what you can expect. All right. Well, I mean, this is the theorem, the way it is formulated here is really just a computation, there is not a big deal. All right, so no, now let's look at the theorem that is a little more interesting. And I explain this in the simplest example. I turn off the interactions between the atoms in the Bose gas. So the Bose gas is an ideal non-interacting Bose gas described in the mean field limit, meaning large density. Okay, the interaction potential for the interactions between the tracer particle and the atoms in the Bose gas is assumed to be smooth and of rapid decay and spherically symmetric and the Fourier transform, the integral of W should be different from zero. All right, I turn off the external potential, there are no external forces. The resulting model we have ma called the B model, B for baby. This is really the sort of model that the baby starts with and then eventually, you know, climbs the harbor model. So here are the equations of motion. Velocity of the tracer particle is momentum divided by mass. Time derivative of the momentum is the, uh, the force exerted by the atoms in the Bose gas upon the particle, which is given by this expression, in the Bogolyubov limit. The quadratic, the term quadratic in beta has been left out. And I beta dot, the equation of motion for the Landau Ginzburg order parameter field is I beta dot equals minus Laplace in over twice the mass of an atom in the Bose gas plus mu times W shifted to the position of the particle at time t. So, we w so these are Hamiltonian equations of motion. We would like to solve them and understand how the solutions behave. All right. So here is a theorem. Under the assumptions I have stated, what? 
given a certain number delta in the interval zero to delta star, delta star is a fixed number, it's roughly equal to 0 0.66. It, it comes by, you know, computing a difficult integral, which was in fact computed on the computer. But maybe one can do it by hand, but I'm not sure. So given delta in the interval zero delta star, there exists an epsilon that may depend on delta, is positive such that if the initial condition for the Ginsburg Landau order parameter is small in the sense that a certain weighted L2 norm is smaller than epsilon, and if the initial velocity of the particle is small in the sense that Q naught modulus Q naught smaller than epsilon, then the solution has the following properties. P of T or the velocity of the particle at time t decays in time and I its modulus is bounded by a constant times t to the minus one half minus delta as time t tends to infinity. So this is the phenomenon of friction. It becomes more and more slow. Beta of t locally in the infinity norm, beta of t approaches this uh, sort of stationary solution that you get by setting beta dot to zero and solving for beta. And the, the wave you were worried about, they, are, they have disappeared at infinity. You don't see them anymore. Obviously, if delta is larger than one half, which is possible, uh, then P of t is integrable in time, and therefore the position of the particle approaches a finite position denoted by x infinity. So in other words, since the Bose gas here is assumed to be ideal, non-interacting, the speed of sound vanishes, Cherenkov, emission of Cherenkov radiation goes on forever, and therefore friction never stops, and therefore the particle eventually comes to rest. That's really the Aristotelian you know, friction phenomenon that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So, uh, say that, I, I, I didn't hear you. Delta. Well, you see, this So this theorem raises maybe more questions than it answers. For example, should we expect that the decay exponent that says how the velocity decays in time depends on initial condition? I think not. So I believe the delta is universal. and bigger than one half and perhaps bigger than 0.66, I mean, that's an estimate. So I believe it always stops at the finite position, but unfortunately, that's not what we can prove for the time being, and I will tell you why, what our problem is. And it's probably just that we are stupid. The dimension, well, this is all in three dimensions. Um, you know, at some point, useful to know that if you look at this part of the wave equation, uh, it decays like two to the minus three halves, which is nicely integrable. So it's, it's really in dimension three or higher. Uh, what exactly happens in dimension one or two, we have actually not studied for the time being. All right, so here, uh, let me very briefly sketch an idea of how we have proven this. Uh, and you will see that probably the approach is in some sense a little stupid, but I invite everybody to come up with a better idea. So we solve the equation for beta as you for a any given trajectory x of t. That is a linear equation. We do it by Duhamel's principle. It's very then we plot the solution for beta t into the equation of motion for the particle. We 
with then it closes and it looks as follows p dot c uh, is a term that depends linearly on the trajectory p sub s for times s between 0 and p another linear term of the similar kind plus a term that is non-linear it depends non-linearly on the entire trajectory of the particle between time 0 and you see, this is an equation of motion with memory, if you like. And the memory, of course, comes from the fact that when the particle interacts with the wave medium, it will bump into waves that it excited earlier. Okay? So that's where the memory comes from. Now, the L1, this linear term L1, has a very simple structure. And here it is f is an explicit function given here and you see here for example dimension 3 uh, appears this function f decays like p to minus 3 half and that's used in some of the estimates so we solve the equation p dot equals l1 of p of p and that the solution is given by a propagator k sub p uh, which is fairly explicitly, uh, I mean, you, we understand how it behaves in, in some detail. And now we convert the equation for P into an integral equation. Uh, and it looks as follows, PP equals KPP naught plus, uh, I mean, that's just obvious how to do that. But we could have converted the equation for P into an inter integral equation simply by integrating the initial equation. That's done here. And then it looks like PP equals P naught plus this uh, nonlinear term. Now compare these two equations, one here and two. They are two equations for the same object P, for the same trajectory P of P. And so what we can do is to consider the equation 1 and subtract from it k of p times equation 2. Then, in fact, the, you know, this k p p naught term will cancel. And we arrive at an equation that can be studied using a fixed point theorem. And this fixed point theorem says that we get the unique solution provided the initial conditions are suitably small. We have to introduce a certain weighted Banach space on the state of trajectories. That's how the exponent delta enters the game. And then we have to check that we get the contraction in that famous situation. That's that is a messy business. And the reason is that the leading term, for example, if you look at this term k of p, p naught, it doesn't decay in the right way. So in other words, you know, it appears that there are terms that decay more slowly than they ought to. And so there is a subtle can cancellation going on which will become manifest when you do this linear combination. So that's a little, I mean, that's really a tricky thing. And uh, I think this would never have been done if uh, Gang had not had the nice idea to look at this combination. So I give him a lot of credit for, you know, having pushed the project to a good end, or at least uh, an end for the time being. You see, there is something strange going on here. These are Hamiltonian equations of motion, but we are not using the Hamiltonian structure of these equations. We are using sort of very generic methods of nonlinear analysis. So I think there should be something more clever that maybe somebody will find out to get uh, more insight into this solution. Yeah.
yeah, a small wave because, you know, be before the particle enters the Bose gas, it consumes more or less in the ground state, which means that beta is very small. Yes, it should die. Uh, yes, and the particle should be a little slow. We don't like. You know, that has a, a good meaning because the sort of the rest frame of the gas is a distinguished rest frame, and with respect to that one, the particle should be, uh, should have slow initial speed. Or oh, you mean extended to yeah. infinity, some plane wave say. Uh, you know, I tend to think this it has small amplitude not going to bother us much. Uh, of course, it's a little strange because it's a, a, a genuine plane wave will never disappear. It will always, you know, wiggle a little bit. So one would have to hope. Uh, if it extends to everywhere, uh, something new will happen, you know. But if you look at the little wave packet, that's not the problem. In fact, I do not believe that the smallness assumptions that appear in the hypotheses are important. If, if beta zero is large and if P zero is large, they just have to wait longer until they become small and then uh, the theorem will take over, the fixed point theorem will take over. But this initial waiting period is something that we cannot control for the time being. That's a problem. All right, so there are similar results for the E model. The E model is the model where you have interactions in the Bose gas, but you describe them in the Bogolyubov limit. It means that the speed of sound is strictly positive. In that case, we have subsonic solutions that is describe a particle moving inertially through the Bose gas, and the supersonic motions where the Part the velocity of the particle initially is has a modulus that is larger than the speed of sound, and that describes uh, a motion with friction and emission of uh, the Renkov radiation. <coughs> the subsonic case is we have studied is fully understood, na namely that these traveling wave solutions are asymptotically stable. So that we understand. The supersonic motion is something that Gang has worked on with some success. It's not entirely finished, but I think it's essentially finished. It becomes one, you know, one more, more complicated than what I just explained. I have just explained. The wave equation is, is a linear equation, but the interaction effects have been taken into account to the extent that the speed of sound is strictly positive. You see, we start with the fully nonlinear wave equation and then pass to this Bogolyubov limit, which means that the gas is very dense, but the interactions are very, very tiny. In that limit, the equation becomes linear again, but the speed of sound gets renormalized to a positive so value. Take that linear wave equation by a nonlinear wave equation. If you do the full nonlinear wave equation, then you have to work even a little harder. And I be, you know, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. This is not always manifest. I sometimes appear to be pessimistic, but I'm basically an optimist. I tend to think it could be done, but it's a lot of work. I think it's not for me, it's for the younger generation. All right, so here are a few other problems that we might want to study, or I invite you to study if you have nothing better to do. Derivation of mean field limits. There has been a lot of activity on mean field limits. It started with Klaus Hepp back in the 70s, and then it sort of uh, fell dormant, and then uh, I, I tend to think I brought it up again in '98, and this uh, 
resulted in some activity due to Erdes and Yao, and Erdes, Yao, and Schlein, and so on. And of course, at some point, I felt I also had to participate. Most of the results that are known today about, you know, why in these mean field limits the quantum theory becomes classical Hamiltonian dynamics, most of these results, in my opinion, are just not very good yet and not very interesting because people never look at systems of a constant temperature in the same dynamic limit. They look at the little cloud of particles and they make the mean field limit. In statistical physics, we would like to have systems at positive temperature and study these systems in the same dynamic limit. I believe this can be done, and I have some ideas, but it hasn't been done yet. It has been somewhat overlooked. There is a baby problem in this direction that we have studied, but it's really a baby problem, so I won't even tell you what it is. So there is need for better results here. Forced motion, for example, an external potential, just a well. You look at the particle falling into a well, obviously you expect to see that the particle relaxes to an equilibrium point of the potential V. Uh, I think this could be proven, but it has not been done. Another problem would be to understand more about these, in these uh, force traveling ways. Then M particle problems, rather than just having one particle, you have several. Even if these particles initially don't interact with each other, there is an effective interaction mediated by the sound waves of the Bose gas, and you get things like binding, you get binary collapse, you know, this is a little like a sort of simplified version of the collapse of two black holes in general relativity. I think this is a collapse phenomenon that is much easier, but it's not totally easy. I mean, there are no rigorous results. Absolutely, and yes. It's and it's going to be attractive, yeah, actually. Yes. And so, you, you know, they will eventually, if, if the initial energy of the particles is small enough, they will bump into each other. They will form a bound state. And because in the presence of the interactions, the motion is not inertial, they will keep emitting radiation until they have lost so much energy that they just collapse onto each other. Oh, well, maybe that's a good question. <laughs> it, never, it, it didn't occur to me to ask this question. In fact, my job here is to, you know, pose problems and, and express conjectures and, and hope that some young people know how to do the mathematics right. All right. So then another nice problem for my taste is to look at entire uh, you know, tribes of particles, many particles suspended in a wave medium, for example, in a wave medium at positive temperature, and to try to derive the Boltzmann equation for the effective dynamic of a particle cloud in the grad limit. Uh, it has certainly not been done if we want to do it fully quantum mechanically, nobody knows how to understand why the Boltzmann equation comes out from quantum dynamics. It seems to be too hard. There are lots of papers by the Romans, Fulvirenti and so on. And the standard problem that appears is that you do some kind of perturbative analysis and you generate too many terms, and so you don't know why it converges. However, if you assume that the Boltzmann equation is a good description of the effective dynamic, and you try to use it to describe the dynamics of a tribe of particles suspended in a wave medium, then in fact there are lots of nice results. And I think this is easier than the Boltzmann equation just of the particles without the wave medium. The wave medium has a regularizing effect. We have, in fact, written a paper about this. I think it's a sort of amusing observation that this Boltzmann equation is, is easier. And in fact, it's also, in some sense, more physical. Because usually, 
you look at particles suspended in a liquid or in a gas, and you want to understand what they do, and uh, I think, I hope, that this can be understood pretty well. All right. So this is, I think, you see, I wanted to say a, a few things about the effect of dynamics and quantum systems, but there will be another talk in just about 20 minutes from now, and so maybe I just stop here. Thank you for your attention.